So in my estimation, under capitalism, <laughs> the ruling <laughs> class of every generation, and in, in feudalism and historically, the ruling class of every generation has a bit of a rotting effect during the Jim Crow era, you know, in the United States, the gr uh, gr greed of railroad monopolists, right, just to come up with some examples. But in many ways, um, I, I, I would say that's a function of, of our version of capitalism. What makes this rot more pungent and pervasive, shall we say? Well, I would say that we had a much more coherent ruling class roughly from the end of the 19th century uh, to maybe the 1970s. And there are the wasps based in the Northeast, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They married together. They came out of a pretty coherent social formation. Uh, they uh, contrived uh, the whole post-World War II order. Um, they developed, they were really specialized in foreign policy, uh, but they, you know, they staffed the Roosevelt administration, uh, then uh, had a, a lot to do with the New Deal, uh, even through then even the Eisenhower years, um, and then back into the 1960s uh, with the Kennedy administration. Um, they uh, were, I think, they had many uh, vices. They were awful racists and snobs, um, but uh, there, there was a... Um, ability to look beyond um, the um, uh, you know the next earnings report or the next election cycle and plan somewhat for the long term uh, I think now we have a group of people who are just uh, driven by accumulating as much money as possible uh, and no sense of anything outside the market anything outside the pursuit of the dollar uh, and certainly that's been true for a lot of American history this has been a, a money obsessed culture but there was a period I think where there was able to um, have a certain degree of, of long-term planning and thoughtfulness that just doesn't exist now and so <clears throat> for example uh, I think that if we had a much more, more coherent ruling class they would be able to think more clearly about the climate crisis and actually do something about it. It might not be what we would like. It might not, you know, it certainly would not be uh, eco-socialism by any means, but it would actually, they would be able to process the problem and do something about it. Uh, and I just don't see that in this current gang. There's just too many, um, you know, um, th there's an ethic of pillage, I think, that really dominates a lot of their thinking. Well, so then what incentives got us to this point? Because, I mean, I know you wrote a, a good amount about the rise of, of the... Uh, private equity of passive investment slash income as a model for economic growth um, and this shift kind of happening in the mid or the mid to late 20th century. Would that would, would that be the number one driver, would you say? Well, there's several things going on. I think, first of all, the wasps got tired as an elite. Um, there's a, uh, an Italian elite theorist uh, who says, you know, history is the graveyard of aristocracies. And that you know, they 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 had really their time had passed. Uh, they uh, there's this you know idea that you know the first generation um, makes the money, the second generation learns to be civilized, and the third generation just becomes you know a bunch of hippie artists and bohemians. Um, and that's a caricature, but there's some truth to it. Uh, their money. Um, got uh, d damaged by, you know, ruined by inflation. Their fortunes are eroded with inflation and inheritance. Uh, but they're also based in a lot of old line industries, particularly like manufacturing in the Northeast and banking in the Northeast. And with um, those, those industries really ran into trouble starting in the 1970s. And um, so the, the material basis of their wealth also eroded. And then beginning in the early 1980s, you saw the rise of this new class of uh, a new set of robber barons driven by you know, borrowed money and went wild in the financial markets, taking over companies, disrupting the entire uh, corporate landscape, the economic landscape, uh, and created fortunes of a sort we hadn't seen in close to a century. Uh, you know, if you look back, the, the Forbes 400 list of the 400 richest people in the US started in 1982. And... There weren't that many billionaires. Certainly, you know, but it's been inflation then, so a billion isn't what it used to be. But uh, that we we just didn't have this class of billionaires that we do now. Um, there's just an accumulation of wealth at the very top, and you know, centimillionaires. Uh, we haven't seen since uh, the period between, say, 1870 and 1929. Um, so there, there's so the, the the old order collapsed, and then they were replaced by this this gang of new plutocrats, with no sense of social responsibility, no sense of anything beyond um, making themselves as rich as possible, and you know, that. Uh, they haven't really established themselves as um, a, a more civilized formation. They're still largely you know, brutal and greedy. 
Well, so, I mean, two questions there. One, how much did that have to do with <clears throat> the modern Republican Party becoming what it is, right, with Nixon and Reagan, um, specifically Reagan, really? Uh, and two, it's it, I feel it's not a uniquely American phenomenon because, you know, colloquially we talk about the rise of neoliberalism. I mean, the the this seems to have been, and yes, it's mostly American, but it, it trickled down into politics internationally, this kind of obsession with markets and um, and, and shareholders as as primary uh, in 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 economic systems. Just talk about those two things. Okay, uh, I'll just start with the, the second one first, because um, I, I think we see something sim something similar going on in Europe. Uh, and a very stark example of that is the way the European elites handle the Euro crisis of you know, like 10 years ago, I guess it's becoming, it's becoming a distant memory. But uh, um, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, the former Greek finance minister and economist, um, told me once in an interview um, that um, the architects of the Euro, the currency, in uh, the early 1980s, uh, had this idea that the thing was kind of crisis, crisis prone, that Paul, um, you know, yoking all these different economies together under one currency would eventually provoke a crisis. And they thought, and he's talking about Mitterrand and Kohl, the leaders of France and Germany at the time, uh, thought that the crisis would provoke a restructuring of the European system so that there'd be much more common governance, common fiscal policy, uh, uh, you know, just a, a much more integration of the political side uh, than, than occurred. But when the crisis hit, um, the, the mediocrities who were governing Europe at that point really had no sense of how to handle it. So it's just driven by German notions of austerity and harsh discipline. But it, they did not use the occasion of that crisis to create a new political order. Now, it might be, not be the political order we would have liked. Again, you know, it would have been probably a neoliberal political order. But um, they, they were unable to use that, that crisis to turn uh, the European EU into something more coherent as a longer term political project. So yes, I think they're really analogs around the world. And you know, look at like Brazil right now, Bolsonaro. Um, oh know, my Brazil, God. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's just, you know, a hellhole. I mean, it's just insane. And a lot of that is a result of um, the erosion of any kind of, of ruling class in Brazil and institutions associated with ruling classes. So yes, it is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, I, I I live here, so I'm most aware of what's going on here. And we also have been you know, the most important uh, bourgeoisie in the world. Um, as the folks at Workers Vanguard used to say, the uh, the president of the United States is the chief executive of the world bourgeoisie. And you know that's still, despite the erosion of US power and prestige, is still sort of true. Uh, but yeah, the Republican Party is a very important part of this story. Uh, and uh, you know, if you go back into the say the 50s, uh, the Eisenhower era, uh, they had made peace with the New Deal, uh, and they didn't necessarily, um, you know, want to expand it, but they also didn't want to destroy it. They, they you know, if their Eisenhower wrote in a famous letter to his brother that anybody who wanted to do, uh, do away with labor laws and social security, uh, would be politically destroyed. Uh, and of course, there are some he mentioned like Texas oil men, he said, There are some people like that, but their numbers are few and they are stupid. And uh, those people eventually, they hated Eisenhower, uh, the, the, those stupid um, and few in number of people hated Eisenhower, and they really organized to transform the Republican Party. And they, they saw it as a project of decades, and they, they were very successful. They turned it into an extreme right-wing formation and purged all those kind of moderates and even liberals from the Republican Party. Well, fast uh, forward, I don't mean to interrupt, but fast forward to the Obama presidency where he was toying with the idea of cutting many of these New Deal programs, at least, you know, in, in his own uh, centrist center left way and and appeasing Republicans in this area. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he, he and Biden, too, they, they have this idea of preemptive compromise. <laughs> like bipartisanship is almost some sort of uh, virtue in itself, uh, rather than just a way of coping with the divided, you know, polity. Um, they just think that, oh, bipartisanship is so beautiful. And, you know, then you've got Mitch McConnell on the other side is just nothing but ruthless. Uh, and a Republican Party that you know, is crazy, in a lot of ways, but they do have a set of principles which they're fervently devoted to. And it's very hard to say the same about the Democratic Party. Uh, and you know, I, um, Obama um, 
was it three months after taking office, he was on the phone with David Brooks saying that once they got out of the recession, they wanted to cut Social Security and Medicare. Um, so yeah, um, they're, they're certainly not innocent. Um, and I think that reflects you know, the growing influence of um, financiers of the Democratic Party, that uh, the same kind of consciousness, which the Republicans have to an extreme, certainly um, has a large presence within the Democratic Party. Um, although I would say that you know, the Democrats are more like Goldman Sachs types, like more respectable more institutional, uh, whereas a lot of the Republican financiers are hedge fund guys and private equity guys who imagine themselves, you know, independent, independent entrepreneurs and cowboys. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 there was that transformation of the Republican Party, uh, and they became to reflect that um, it, starting in the 80s, this this new class of plutocrats and cowboys who were just rampaging across the landscape, uh, you know, just uh, loading things up with debt, taking out money and stuffing it into their pockets. And uh, that really became um, more and more the ethic of how American business worked, uh, which was just get the profits up no matter what the cost, uh, with the social or environmental cost. And that's, uh, you know, somebody else's problem to clean up the mess. Hi, I'm Sam Cedar. You can watch the rest of this interview and more on our Peacock show, which streams at 5 p.m. weekdays on The Choice from Peacock TV.